in-person and live Zoom worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. Our, op Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Our opening hymn this morning is number 1028, The Fire of Commitment from the Teal Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the Spirit moves you and stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 1028, The Fire of Commitment. Thank um.
Thank you for joining us here in person, and thank you for joining us remotely by Zoom, where we will continue live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel for our virtual attendees. I'm Grace Preuss, a member of the Worship Committee, and I will be your worship associate today. Other members of the Worship Committee who make this service possible include Alec Peck, our music coordinator, his partner, Margaret, who just led us in the song, and he is also running the soundboard today, as well as Adam Wedeking, who is monitoring our visual and online connections. We welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and an open heart, and with muted electronic devices, please. We invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship is inspiring and powerful. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate, and wiser as we begin a new day and a new week. Although our, oh, sorry, that's old. <laughs> okay. Before we move into the service, there are a few announcements we would like to share. We will mention several websites, email addresses, and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all of this information, and it is also available on our website. Festival of Lights. It's that time of the year again. The 2023 Mission Inn Festival of Lights will be held from November 18th to December 31st. Downtown light displays will be illuminated from 5 to 10 p.m. UUCR will open to the public during these festivities. We will have snack and drink sales, as well as crafts made by some of our members and a selection of gently used Christmas items. Donations of snacks, bottled water, and individual packages of hot chocolate are appreciated. Please see Robert or Avery for details. Bake sale. There will be a bake sale on the third Sunday, November 19th. If you'd like to contribute or purchase special treats, this is your chance. All proceeds go to the church fund. Silent auction. Our silent auction is beginning today. You can bid on the items and service services that are displayed on the auction table out in the parish hall. This is a fundraiser and all proceeds will go to the church fund. A Thanksgiving potluck lunch will be held in the parish hall on Thursday, November 23rd from 1230 to 4 p.m. We invite you to bring your favorite dishes to share in the meal. A sign-up sheet is available at the membership table by the front of the entrance. Come celebrate with us. We hope to see you there. Please see Grace or Robert for more details. And now I'd like to call up Adam Wedeking, the chair of our Social and Environmental Justice Committee for a special announcement regarding the Gaza crisis. Adam. Good morning. I'm going to read to you the UUA statement on the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and Israel. The Unitarian Universal Association, UUA, joins the chorus of voices urging an immediate and total ceasefire, the admittance of humanitarian aid, and the restoration of power and water to Gaza to prevent the further staggering loss of human life that is inevitable under the current conditions. We support the call from the United Nations for the evacuation order to be rescinded, warning it will have devastating humanitarian consequences. We join a wide range of faith-based, non-governmental, and humanitarian organizations across the globe in condemning the government of Israel's ongoing bombardment, total siege, and forced displacement and evacuation order of more than 1.1 million residents of Gaza in retaliation for Hamas's atrocious October 7th acts. We do so in line with our 2002 action for immediate witness toward peace and justice in the Middle East. To address the urgent humanitarian crisis in Gaza and Israel, and to prevent further catastrophic loss of life, the UUA reiterates as a signatory of the October 12th statement from Churches for Middle East Peace, a call for one, ceasefire, de-escalation and restraint by all sides. Two, all parties to abide by the laws of war, including the Geneva Conventions and customary international law, 
and three, prioritizing steps to secure the immediate release of hostages and ensure international protection for civilians. The UUA condemns the horrific terror attacks from Hamas on Israeli civilians and the taking of innocent hostages. There can never be justification for such an attack. The UUA condemns the harm to innocent civilians caused by the Israeli government's retaliation against Gaza and implores the Israel, Israeli government to do all it can to protect innocent civilian life and to avoid further escalating military action. We call on all Unitarian Universalists to continue to witness against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and decide with love in this moment by urging their elected officials to leverage the considerable power of the U.S. government to push for an immediate and humane resolution to the crisis in Gaza, including total ceasefire, humanitarian aid access, and rescinding the evacuation order. If you would like to read this statement and also um, on the UUA's page, there's a lot of information, history information and links to other actions for immediate witness and other statements that have been made in the past. Um, and also to learn how you can take action. For example, right now, the Five Calls app will connect you to your representatives um, and you can ask, there's a script there to ask for a ceasefire. Um, you can check out the bit.ly that I have here, Gaza Update UUCR, that will stay updated with, with actions that you can, that you can do. Um, you can, can scan the QR code or just check out the webpage. Um, at our next Social and Environmental Justice Committee meeting, which will be next week, we will talk about possibly visiting our um, uh, representative in the House of uh, Representatives, uh, Mark DeCano, and asking him to call for a ceasefire because he has not yet. All right, thank you. Thank you, Adam. And now I invite you to sit back and take a slow, deep breath as we move into the worship hour. You are welcome to read with me the mission statement of our church. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. Today we will have a reading of a sermon that was written by Victoria Safford and added to the UUA website on January 21st, 2015. Victoria Safford is the minister at White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. She is author of Walking Toward Morning, the 2003 UUA Meditation Manual, and With or Without Candlelight, a meditation anthology. Today's sermon is entitled, Turquoise Patriot. What does patriotism mean? What does love of country mean in today's world? And what has it ever meant to you? What does love of country mean? And how will you find the words to express it? Your own words to express your own sense of what it means to be a citizen of this country, especially in such polarized times as we live in. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign peoples, the original people of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupy was first the sacred space of several groups of indigenous peoples, including the Kawiya, the Cupeño, and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to be part of a world community with peace, 
liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Now for our chalice lighting, today's reading for the chalice lighting is That Which Abides by Martha Kirby Kappel. Through the week, this chalice abides, cupped and silent. Softly it gleams in a dim, dimly lit room, complete unto itself. Today we come together as a community of faith, joyful and free. Our individual energies combine to spark the flame of truth. May we each draw strength for the other, and like the chalice, may we be bathed in the fire of commitment to social justice, equity, and peace. Thank you, Bill. Greeting our guests. We have a tradition at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. We know it can be uncomfortable to stand up and speak in front of others. And so I will now ask for a volunteer from someone who has been here a while to tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic and speak into it directly and clearly so everyone can hear. Please be aware that you will be visible on our Zoom camera and in the recording of this service, which is posted online. Do we have any volunteers this morning? Thank you, Dinah. Good morning. And uh, my husband and Bill and I have been members here since 2004. Prior to that, we were at the Long Beach Church until we moved to this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dinah. And that's how it's done. If you are new here, a visitor or an old friend, please raise your hand to stand up and come to the mic in front of the pulpit. Do we have any brave souls today? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Am I on? Hello. My name is Willie Luca. Um, my wife, Lisa, and I are happy to visit with you today. Um, we're from Thousand Oaks. I've been at UU since about 1980. Hmm. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you for joining us. Is there anyone else who'd like to come up? If there's someone online who would like to introduce themselves, please raise your hand and we will call on you by Zoom. Please let us know who you are, where you are from, and how you found out about us. No. Okay. For any other new guests, please join us for socializing and coffee hour after the service. We'd love to chat with you out in the parish hall where you can also find our visitor's book or tablet. Please leave your name before you leave so that we know you are here and leave your contact information if you'd like to know about upcoming events. For those online, the best way to get added to the mailing list is to email the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Our hymn now is number 1020, Wo Ya Ya, from the Teal Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the Spirit moves you and stand in body or spirit and join us in singing number 1020, Wo Ya Ya. We are going, heaven knows where we are We know with it.
sharing our stewardship. SOS, or Sharing Our Spirit, is an annual program to help families in need during the holiday season. All of the income from this fundraiser goes into our designated SOS fund. Our goal this year is $2,500. We will be asking for donations for this program today. Please mark all donations to this fund as SOS. You may write this on the subject line of your check or place cash contributions in the specially marked envelopes in the pews and place them in the offertory plates. If you would like to help us reach more families this holiday season, UUCR will graciously accept mon monetary contributions and donations of new or gently used toys, clothing, packages of underclothes, socks, blankets, toiletries, etc. All monetary donations and donated items are tax deductible. Thank you for your support. Um, I think we can go around and collect the SOS donations first. Or should we come? Combine it? Okay. All right. So that is for the SOS contributions. And for our regular offertory, this portion of our service is to support our beloved historical church. This can be accomplished in several ways. In addition to the weekly collection, you may send your checks to the church address, which is shown here. You may also contribute by PayPal using the QR code, which is shown here, as well as on the church website and in the newsletter. Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater grocery cards, which we will have in church each Sunday. Amazon gift cards are also available. You will get the full value, and the church also receives a percentage for free. Please see Dinah Rowe, Dinah Rowe or Robert Brown in the church office if you are interested in purchasing the gift cards. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity and to those who give of their time and their talent. Thank you for your generous care and attention. And for all of you who have joined us here today, we thank you for the gift of your presence. Will our ushers now please come forward to receive the collection? A bag will also be passed around to collect any food or hygiene items for those in need. Thank you. Our next hymn is number 402, From You I Receive, from the Gray Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the Spirit moves you and stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 402, From You I Receive.
Our meditation today is from Annie Forster. You are invited to read the bold and italicized lines that are shown on the slide. Peace is more than the absence of worry. It is the creation of safe havens for all. It is the building of security for everyone. It is the forgiveness of self, as well as one who would harm you. It is the intent listening to diverse points of view. It is the intentional speaking of all voices, one at a time. It is the tension within silence that welcomes all thoughts. It is studying the hard lesson of letting go. It is breathing through pain into tranquility. It is forming friendship out of enmity. It is observing the promised truce when anger would say no. It is finding the just compromise when the ego would say my way. It is striving for reconciliation when the heart would say revenge. Now let us pause for a moment of silence and contemplation. Now I would like to introduce Pat Cowender, who will be reading the sermon, Turquoise Patriot. Pat. Good morning. Um, this sermon was written by Victoria Safford, who's the minister, used to be the minister in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I always want to know when it's an old sermon, when it was written. So I reached out to her. I found her on Facebook because we're both friends with the former president, Susan Gray. And um, I messaged her and I got a response right away. And she said that this was written after 9-11. So I invite you to think back to 9-11 and how we felt. Now this is relevant because of the crisis in the Middle East, but I thought it was important that it was written in nine, after 9-11. A child I know, when asked this week whether she would answer the call of her elementary school principal to wear red, white, and blue clothes on Thursday, was in a quandary. She put down the crayon with which she was painstakingly trying to squeeze the world's peace is possible onto the white bars between the red bars on a small American flag she had made and said, with what I think like to think is a remarkable command of the idiom of the heartland, as well as an uncanny awareness of the subtlety of language, well, it's a pretty good country, so it's hard to know what to wear. Not exactly mindless nationalism, 
but provocative this week nonetheless. It is a pretty good country. It's one of hundreds and hundreds of pretty good countries, lightly layered relatively recently onto the skim of topsoil or desert sand or water, which cover the thin skin of our globe. Hundreds of pretty good countries filled with millions of pretty good and believe it or not, proud and worthy people. Those other lands with sunlight too and clover and skies are everywhere as blue as yours and mine. Oh, hear my song, thou God of all nations, a song of peace for their lands and for mine, a song of peace for my pretty good, but pretty complicated country, where this week, I who am a lifelong citizen feel even more than usual like an alien, afraid that if I speak my voice, might betray not some foreign place of origin, but the geography of my heart. It is hard to know what to wear. Which country, asks Edward Said, professor of literature at Columbia, and for so long a voice of hope for the Palestinians and others? Which country? I've never felt that I belonged exclusively to one country, nor have I been able to identify patriotically with any other than losing causes. Patriotism is best thought of as an obscure dead language, learned prehistorically, but almost forgotten and almost unused ever since. Nearly everything normally associated with it, wars, rituals of nationalistic loyalty, sentimentalized or invented traditions, parades, flags, etc., is quite dreadful and full of appalling claims of superiority and preeminence. But perhaps those are all the results of applied patriotism. Is theoretical patriotism really that much better? Thinking affectionately of, at, about home is all I'll go along with. What does patriotism mean? What does love of country mean this week? And what has it ever meant to you? Love of freedom, love of speech and movement, human rights and civil rights, what else? What does it mean to be engaged and actively engaged if you pay taxes, if you grew up and have been educated here, if you have not fled to Canada, but in fact have stayed, all this time have stayed, and even proudly stayed, some have never thought of leaving. What does it mean to be engaged in the magnificent experiment of democratic government that this country is, with its brilliant promise of pluralism, as yet a promise unfulfilled, but beckoning and possible? Underneath it all, there is a magnificent experiment going on, despite the fact that somewhere along the way, American democracy seems to have become synonymous with capitalism, or maybe it was always thus, and synonymous with the presumptuous arrogance regarding the rest of the world that is simply neither practical nor prudent any longer. What are we so loyal to? What is it that we'd die for, or more likely, that we'd send our young to die for? And for what in the coming months or weeks or days or hours will we be so eager to kill? What does patriotic mean when, as the media keeps telling us, 85% or 89% of the American public vigorously supports the president and Congress in their intention to wage war, a global war, a world war, perhaps World War III against terrorism? What does love of country mean? And how will you find the words to express it? Your own words to express your own sense of what it means to be a citizen in this country. I have heard so many of you coming from all corners of this conver conversation share this week your loneliness. So many years ago, Martin Luther King spoke to members of 
clergy and, la and laity concerned. A time comes when silence is betrayal. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is the most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men and women do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in times of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexing as they often do in the case of this recent dreadful conflict, the war in Vietnam, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty, but we must move on and we must speak. At this point, silence is betrayal of your own integrity, your own heart, and then ultimately of the whole enterprise. If freedom, freedom of speech and thought and belief is what's on the table. Silence, conformity, acquiescence to the loudest, most nationalistic or, or militaristic majority view, just because it is simpler, it is clearer. And in fact, it does speak to a portion of your own emotional response. None of these is worthy now. Silence, conformity, and acquiescence in times like these always betray your heart and your country. Nothing is at last sacred, said Emerson, but the integrity of your own mind, to which I would add the step he did not take and say the true sanctity is in the place where your mind stretches out to meet that of someone else, the sacred meeting ground of hearts and minds. You have to speak it. Audrey Lord, the poet, said it differently, but with equal force. I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. We can sit in our corners mute forever while our sisters and brothers and ourselves are wasted, while our children are distorted and destroyed, while our earth is poisoned. We can sit in our safe corners mute as bottles and we will still be no less afraid. My silence has not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. Here, let us recall the times we have remained silent. And here, let us find our voices. This is a time when there is great risk for some in speaking what is most important to them, of having it bruised and misunderstood. But it is always such a time, and the risk of not speaking is almost always greater still. I know that among all the things I learned about our country in the flag-draped public schools of New York State, one for sure, taught by McCarthy Democrats and Goldwater Republicans alike, was that to speak is patriotic, to speak out is patriotic, to act out even can be patriotic. To resist and to dissent and sometimes to disobey is patriotic. To hold this government accountable is patriotic. To resist and dissent and sometimes to disobey. I learned early on watching leaders, prophets, preachers fall that the cost of true patriotism can be very, very high. Robert Goldberg a retired rabbi from New Haven writes, I'm a patriot and proud of it, with three files to prove it. The first of these was printed on the stationery of the House Un-American Activities Committee in the early 50s and distributed in the parking lot of my temple and all across the state by the so-called Connecticut Committee Against Communism. I obtained the other two files years later thanks to the Freedom of Information Act. Sources of information that compelled my patriotic conscience were, among others, the Judaic heritage of social justice based on the Hebrew prophets, 
the example of other clergymen like Martin Luther King and William Slug Coffin, and not least of all, the American Bill of Rights. We are coming into such a difficult time when to speak and to hear all our many and various truths with our families, our neighbors, the parents of our children's friends, our own parents and our own children, our colleagues, with anyone, will entail enormous risk and require no small courage. To speak and hear our many truths in here will be, already is a risk, for we have not of one mind or heart here, politically or theologically, nor would we have it so. We ourselves are a magnificent experiment in pluralism. Unitarian growing, Unitarianism growing up as it did on this continent, simultaneous with the Republic, and still we're learning as we go how to cherish one another's freedom, one another's truth, as dearly as our own. Some of you have asked this week, is nonviolence part of our tradition? Does Unitarian Universalism have a theology of pacifism? Is there any claim upon us there, anything to go by? We respond, there is not that we are not like the Quakers, the Mennonites, the Brethren, one of the traditional peace churches. Our history is rich with the wise and brave influence of pacifists among us and those devoted to nonviolence. John Haynes Holmes, the brilliant minister so many years ago at Community Unitarian in New York City, of all places, comes to mind. But we are rich as well with the influence of conscientious combatants, chaplains, veterans, civilians, lay and clergy both. There is not, nor can there be, consensus here, nor coercion, for we come from many different houses, many thoughtful lives, and we are unwilling to cede our imaginations, our ethical, political, or spiritual imaginations to any form of absolutism, any form of fundamentalism. We are divided among ourselves and most of all this week within ourselves, unified in grief and shock, and maybe even unified in outrage. We are divided among ourselves and in ourselves about what will be or what ought to happen next. We believe this house can stand our differences, can shelter and encourage them and help us each to hold to the agonizing discipline of complex not simplistic reasoning, however distressing it may feel. Here, we hope, the clear stream of reason will not lose its way in the dreary desert of dead habit. So where are you coming from, friend, with your black armband, with your flag, with your red, white, and blue clothing, with your peace sign, with your tears? What roads have you traveled? to reach the place where you are. In our pretty good country, in our pretty good church, it is an honor and a privilege to answer and in turn to ask. I know that I received my own religious education, not principally at Yale, nor even in the church, but in a maximum security prison in Rhode Island, where I served 30 days of a six month sentence for spray painting thou shalt not kill on a missile tube for a trident nuclear submarine. From the four Roman Catholic nuns and three Quaker women, all elders who were with me, and from my own journey through the justice system, from the American African-American prostitutes and pushers with whom I shared so small and intimate a space for so short a time, and from prior and subsequent actions and study and reflection, I learned much that I know of patriotism and principle, those little markers by which you try to frame some kind of meaning, by which you try to set a course that might have some integrity coherence, a path that could be ethical or moral. I am unrepentant still, never rehabilitated, 
and my beliefs are more than theoretical. They are practical applied. They are political and economic, and they are originally and ultimately religious. They are inconvenient often, sources of shame when I can't or won't live up to them, and they are in process always, never fixed. So there's one place I'm coming from, but regardless of this history, regardless of my own debatable conclusion, I am called, as each one of you here is called, you the members of this congregation, to minister with open heart and mind to all who seek the truth in love, regardless of their history, no matter where their search has brought them. I am called, as you are called, to hear and hold the truths of the every searching soul among us here. These are our sacred text, these truths that may differ deeply from our own, and they are gifts. They can sharpen, they can soften, they can, if we will let them, in every way refine our own values, our own truths. This, by the way, in case anyone ever asks you, is what UU is all about this magnificent experiment in pluralism. And it looks like for the next little while, for the rest of our lives, it may be the hardest work we do. I don't know how to make this plain enough. Do you know that during the Vietnam War, our congregations, UU congregations, were split right down the middle as many mainline churches and synagogues were split by ideology and politics, and some of them did not recover. They were never healed. By split, I mean that people left, ministers were fired, buildings closed. Here is a moment to practice our religion more perfectly, to live up to our great covenant. In the coming days and weeks, I charge you to be very brave and very careful with each other and with the purposes we cherish here. We are going to rise to it. Patriotism, wrote one artist, is a radical dedication to the ideals on which one's country were founded, an ability to see through ephemeral issues to enduring ones, to hold course in the midst of political storms, to retain one's commitment to free speech in the midst of war hysteria. Patriotism, as opposed to the kind that is the last refuge of a scoundrel, essentially is an ability to see the sweep rather than the blips of history. It is rare in any age. That was written by Erica Jong in 1991. It is hard to see the sweep of history, of human history this week, stretching backwards, arching forward, across centuries and continents and cultures, that rise and cultures that fall, hard to see the longer arc through the forest of flags hysterically waving. Symbols are deceptive and so dangerous. Crosses, crescents, flags of any colors, a veil or scarf around the head, a turban, yellow ribbons. I hear the factories in China are working day and night to keep up with the demand for American flags of all sizes. The ironies here are beyond comment. From the factories of China, they are flowing. Flags of defiance, flags of arrogant, retaliatory vengeance, opportunistic political flags, flags of mindless nationalism, flags of support for one another, flags of love for the beautiful and troubled land we live in. Flags of respect for the thousands dead. Flags of grief and sorrow, nothing more. Our symbols are so loaded and they speak so loudly and half the time we don't know what they're even saying. A patriot should ask. This is a time for patriotic questions. What does it mean to wage a global war against terrorism? If this could be done, why wasn't it done before? As one writer said this week, how do you take massive military action against the infrastructure of a stateless, compartmentalized army 
of 50 or 10 times 50, whose weapons are rental cars, credit cards, and airline tickets. The mobilization is massive. It's like nothing we have seen, yet no effort could be large enough to cut through every heart that harbors hatred or aggression. Whom will we be fighting exactly and precisely? Whom will we call enemy? Who in the world might welcome and delight in, and even coldly as predicting a cataclysmic conflagration between Islam, what he construes as Islam and the West? Does it matter that many in the world and many in this country and some right in this room might use words like terror to describe the policies and actions of our own government, this government we cherish? From the bombings of Cambodia, Nagasaki, Baghdad, Granada, to the schooling and arming of so many heinous regimes, regimes in Latin America and Africa, to the strange ties we've held at different times for different purposes, even with people like Saddam Hussein, Manuel Noriega, or Osama bin Laden. What really are we loyal to? What usefulness can nationalism serve now as the old world yields to a new century? What is America's right relation and right role? What course is most likely to lead in the end to more security for everyone, more peace, more liberty, more justice for everyone in this one pretty good country and in all the others. And what are you going to wear? This child in the, in the quandary found her own remarkable response this week. When asked on Wednesday night what she thought she'd like to do, she did say, it's a pretty good country. And she looked up then for confirmation of this claim for some assurance that this guess might in fact be true. And this I gave her. She knows I have my doubts, but needs to be reminded just as I do, that they go hand in hand with hopes and dreams so passionate, so powerful. And then she said, deeply serious, without seeking my collaboration or permission, I think I'm gonna wear turquoise, pink and beige for now. And so she did. And I don't know if she knows what risk might be entailed there, what wrath she may incur among her playmates on playground or her teachers or her principal, or how her own chosen symbols of ambivalence might be misunderstood. I don't know what confidence she may inspire in this country to which she has not even learned at her young age to pledge allegiance yet. Her allegiance is to her own conscience, and her trust is still for now with the adults in whose clumsy hands her entire future is contained. These words come from Maya Angelou. We the people on this small and drifting planet whose hands can strike with such abandon that in a twinkling life is sapped from the living Yet those same hands can touch with such healing, irresistible tenderness. We, this people on this wayward floating body, created on this earth of this earth, we have the passion, we have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. We, the people in whose mouths abide cantankerous words, which challenge our very existence, yet out of these same mouths come songs of such exquisite sweetness that the heart falters in its labor and the body is quieted into all when we come to it. To this day of peacemaking, we must confess that we are the possible, we are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world.
Our closing hymn is number 168, One More Step from the Gray Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the spirit moves you and stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 168, One More Step. is a revolutionary act. It means to trust the outsider we fear, to wish well those who have hurt us, and to forgive at last ourselves. To offer the blessing to those around you is to love your neighbor and yourself and to be at peace with God. Peace. Peace be with you. Namaste. Amen and blessed be. Thank you, Pat, for sharing your valuable time and the sermon, re sermon reading with us this morning. It is sincerely appreciated, and we look forward to hearing from you again. For those of you who would like to stay in the sanctuary for 10 to 15 minutes to share some discussion or observations from the service, please remain in the sanctuary or online. And please be aware that these comments will be posted online. For the rest of you, you are now welcome to adjourn into the parish hall. Would anyone like to come up and share their thoughts on what we heard this morning? I appreciated the, the talk that was given and um, especially hearing from Maya Angelo. It's always wonderful. So I have something else that I dreamt up several days ago and I'm going to just do it. <laughs> I'm trying to relate what happened over or what is happening in Gaza to um, here. It seems that Venezuela is under sanctions. And so great many people from Venezuela are flooding into Mexico. Mexico does not like this at all. And so they are angry and they've been harassed. And we also don't like it because those Venezuelans are pressing on our border, creating tension between ourselves and Mexico. During uh, 16 years of the ongoing harassment, it seems that just now the neo-Nazi clanners from our side 
have chosen to go in and to murder 1,400 people in Mexico. This has upset us a great deal to where, oh no, I've lost my train, of had it all planned out. Anyway, Mexico, um, in retaliation, they have struck back, killing about 11,000 people to our north. But here in the Southland, if you've ever been to Loma Linda, you've seen that beautiful, beautiful children's hospital. It even has the figure of an adult holding hands with a child, very a very pretty figure, multiple colors. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to go over and see that beautiful children's hospital, the pride in the heart of Loma Linda community. Now picture, if you will, just as with 9-11, the pancaking of those twin towers, so too this beautiful, wonderful children's hospital has just been flattened completely to where it looks just like how 9-11, how the, the towers went smashed, looked the debris, the concrete. Now, there was a poll taken before, um, or rather there was a poll taken just after um, the incursion of our neo-Nazi planners into Mexico. And we said, we do not think uh, that we believe in, that that was right, that the neo-Nazi planners have done this. After the flattening of the hospital, there is another poll. And we still say that we do not align ourselves with the neo-Nazi planners, but we are sure that none of us will ever go to Acapulco or Montsalon for vacation. Thank you. Bill? <clears throat> There's a mild trick I've been using lately, being a a uh, self-centered guy who likes the sound of his own voice. I like it <laughs> because I'm a generous self-centered uh, guy with a loud voice. I'm sharing it. Uh, it goes something like this. I've, uh, whenever you've got somebody who said they should be punished, or lately I, uh, I seem to be reading an awful lot of the political stuff. Well, okay, I'm all over the field. When dealing with a religious issue, it's... Uh, Often uh, the if the only way you got to say you were right and that the bad guys got what they deserved is that if you had to stand in hell along with them, same gasoline shirt and pants, that you had to, uh, you is it heaven for you if somebody else isn't suffering and is inflicting justice something that you are willing to burn and suffer for. Can you sell a non-reciprocal system that would ha uh, could you live in the system that you are asking them to live in? There's some stuff online where basically it seems like two different sets of manipulators, uh, young ladies who want to uh, uh, try to fa uh, fashion a living off of uh, OnlyFans and a bunch of guys who are trying to basically uh, build a, uh, uh, st a bunch of Stepford wives. I, I, I find no joy in either of them. And, you know, you if you can catch them and say, this is a non-reciprocal system, you wouldn't want, there's, you wouldn't want to live under that system. How can you sell an idea that you would not yourself live under? And it seems to be doing some good. It seems to be uh, the, oh, you mock them. Okay, well, in order for them to, to, if you can keep them suffering, but you have to go through the same approximate uh, uh, pain, how really into hurting someone uh, uh, are you? The answer usually comes up, not that much. And if it's not that much, the next step is, how can we pull ourselves out of the mud and uh, carry at least one neighbor with us? And it seems to work surprisingly well. 
at the very least, it gets them to looking at solving a problem or uh, the wrongness of a system that they see in ways that do not involve bludgeoning the heck out of somebody with physical and metaphysical force. We all know our share of black belts, martial artists, good shots, and guys who could jimmy a car and make you go off the road at, night, uh, at 60 mile an hour. Well, hopefully not too many of the latter. But the idea is that power stays in our lives, number one, because we can't expel it, and number two, because it knows when to stop pushing, to stop being malevolent, to be kind. And if we can, in our own po sometimes powerless lives, do the same sort of thing, perhaps uh, uh, we'll be able to make some of the changes that uh, we heard about today. Grace? Uh, so one phrase that struck me from that reading was, uh, we the people. And we are all people. So it should stay with the people. Good. Yeah. I probably shouldn't do this, but I have a strong opinion about UUA calling for a ceasefire until the hostages are released, the original attack continues in terms of its effect and the hostages need to be released first. And I know that's not an opinion that everybody shares, but I really feel adamant about that. This whole thing was predictable from the attack. So my thoughts. Again. I think that's it. You think that's it? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So thank you all for sharing and your observations. And now you are adjourned and to enjoy more fellowship in the parish hall. Thank you for being here. <laughs>